morning, good morning, colleagues. Good morning to everyone who is listening to us today from across the continent and from across the diaspora. Welcome to the second day of our Africa Consultative Conference for the Africa and Africa Diaspora Conference. We had a wonderful, wonderful day yesterday and I am so happy that you could join us today. My name mm -hmm. is Mujang Kugumbi, and I'm going to be your facilitator for today. First of all, can I just say that if you need translation, there is a, a, an icon at the bottom of the screen that you can press. It's called interpretation, and you can decide whether you want to listen in French or in English. Thank you so much for joining us. As you know, the celebration and recognition of this relationship between the Africa and the African diaspora is very important for the future of Africa. There's in one book, the Manchester Conference of 1945 is described as that historic moment when Pan-Africanism became an idea whose time has come. I hope that through this conference and the one next year in 2021, we can give meaning to that statement that now Africa's time has come. We've had a number of false starts and I hope that this time from what I heard yesterday, we are now starting the people's movement towards getting to that point of the Africa that we want. Let me not take up too much of your time. Today we have a, a fantastic lineup of speakers, mostly young, but uh, not all of us are young. So I'm going to first ask Dr. Sipoka Zimagadla who is going to summarize yesterday's proceedings. Dr. Magaza, I've already apologized, Magaza, sorry, that I'm not going to introduce all of you in full. She is a leading, one of the leading uh, light young scholars that we have. She was at the Institute of International Studies, if I'm not wrong, and she's now at the university one of our leading universities in South Africa, in Makanda. She corrected me. I used the, the old name for the university and she corrected me. She's a, she's a leading scholar on international relations. Dr. Magala, over to you. You have five minutes. Thank you very much, Advocate Gumbi. It is an honor to be part of this conversation. And as you said, my task is to just remind us of some of the points that we raised uh, in starting off this consultative conference that invites us to really uh, imagine the courage that it took those Africans and Africans in the diaspora 70 years ago to imagine African freedom. So Reverend Chikane started us off by saying in 1945, only three countries of Africans and Africans in the diaspora were or, or had political liberation. Uh, of course, we can argue uh, if, if uh, Liberia really had political freedom in 1945, but it had um, a cosmetic political freedom, Haiti, um, as well as Ethiopia. And it was striking to me that that same year of 1945, which is, of course, the year of the founding of the United Nations, the Union of South Africa was allowed to become one of the founding members of the United Nations. So in spite of the lessons that countries in the West had learned of the devastation of the Second World War, they were still willing to accept a minority government to speak on behalf of, black, of the black majority um, in South Africa. And in many ways, the start of the UN itself shows us some of the tensions um, about the visions of, liber of liberal peace that actually is very comfortable uh, with sitting side by side 
with the oppression of Africans. So Reverend Chikane reminded us that 70 years later, my generation is invited to think, to rethink the urgency of freedom. The words that he used was that we must leapfrog to freedom in this fourth, uh, well, in this talk about the fourth industrial revolution. And all of us agree that Africa has all the ingredients uh, to make this an African century. We have the, some of the, the youngest population in the world. We have the resources and indeed we have the creative genius to make this an African century. Reverend Angelique uh, Walker-Smith reminded us also that the journey for Africans in the diaspora to some kind of political freedom has taken us 400 years. So as we are you know, making sense of the violence that African-Americans are facing um, in, the, in the United States, we must not lose sight of how long this walk of freedom has been, but it must uh, confirm, it, was, it must re-energize us um, to commit towards freedom. I also very much enjoyed a, uh, a man Kier's conversation about how the African Union's engagements with its diaspora are part and parcel of the broader transformation of the African Union uh, from the Organization of African Unity. She made it quite clear that to many Africans, the OAU was irrelevant because it privileged self-determination, sorry, it privileged sovereignty at the expense of the freedom of African people. And so while she walked us through the various activities of connecting Africa and the standard, if the African Union has actually transformed and made itself more relevant to Africans, the hundreds of first years that I teach seem to still know more details about the United Nations more than they know about the African Union. So it seems to me that more work still needs to be done to make the African Union really the union of African people and not the union of African heads of states. I also liked uh, Professor Pigana's context of this Manchester moment where he argued that it must invite us to, to think about um, you know, what we center in terms of how we talk to Yeah, they too. I'll send it to you, Christina. Have we lost contact? What's my focus? You are on mute. Yes, uh, sorry, advocate. I see that the system kicked me out. I, I will finish. Okay, it. I can hear you now. Okay, thank you so much. So I was reflecting on uh, Prof. Picana's. Um, comments about the significance of that Manchester moment. And in read, you know, thinking about his talk as well as the discussion document that he wrote about the, the Manchester moment, I, I was struck by a part of the statement that he quotes where he says um, the, the Africans that met in Manchester, you know, they committed, they said, we want the right to earn a decent living, the right to, to express our thoughts and emotions, to adopt and create forms of beauty. And this speaks to a broader argument that somehow from you know, the liberation that African countries got from the 19, achieved rather from the 1960s has narrowly focused on self-determination and yet the radical vision of Pan-Africanism was not just about political freedom. It was more of a holistic uh, commitment uh, to African unity that would not only liberate Africans, but would actually liberate um, the world. And so those debates about the Casablanca and Monrovia uh, blocks are very uh, interesting and exciting for us to reflect on as we are excited about these new instruments, such as the African Continental Free Trade um, Agreement which really aims to, re, um, to integrate Africa economically 
And a striking point that Pigana made uh, is the tension between an excitement now about African integration, but there's very little excitement about the free movement of African peoples. So if you look at the majority of African countries that have signed AFTA compared to how many countries have not signed the movement for the, uh, the free movement of African peoples that South Africa has also not signed, there is a sense that we can achieve uh, a pan-Africanist future without the free movement of Africa uh, in Africa. I think this is a fallacy. We cannot achieve genuine uh, pan-Africanist liberation in the absence of the free movement of African peoples. And one of the ways in which, um, one of the things that have undermined our quest for African unity and liberation is the holding up to these colonial borders. Unless in the century of this vision 2063, we rethink um, in, in a, in a found fundamental manner our, our relationship to these borders. I'm not convinced that we will achieve integration, let alone genuine uh, liberation. And perhaps to throw it to the colleagues that will come after me, I am very excited by the dominance of Afrobeat music, um, which shows us that when artists from Nigeria, the birth of Afrobeat, from South Africa, from Kenya, from Tanzania come together, uh, they can make money, but they can also bring joy and pleasure and beauty to Africans. It is not a mistake that Beyonce chose Afrobeat as her latest album. It speaks to that creative genius of Africans um, when we work together. So I'll stop there, uh, Advocate Gumbi. I'm well past my five minutes. Thank, thank you. you so much. So thank you so much, Spokazi, and thank you so much for that passion that I know is is always there. And uh, and and you ended on an upbeat note. Uh, you know, when uh, some of us uh, uh, are always dancing to that Afrobeat from from uh, from Nigeria to to Cameroon to Senegal, to Congo. But, but thank you so much for summarizing what was said yesterday and picking up on some of the key issues that Reverend Chikane spoke about. I won't summarize a summary. That's not what I do. And also I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that Reverend, Reverend Dennis Dillion is really, uh, uh, I'm sure he's keeping his eye on the outcome of the elections, Reverend. We, we have been following on the side and uh, I, we don't want to enter American politics, but I must tell you, speaking for myself, I'm very hurt that uh, a man who represents so much hate would come this close to getting another four years uh, in the White House, uh, hate against women and against people of color. Uh, it's, it's very hateful. But let me just introduce you first, and then we can hear from you. Reverend Dennis Dillion is a, the global convener for the door of our return. Some of you would have read about it. As I said, I've, uh, I've spoken to my friends in Ghana. It's a wonderful program. And he's led a delegation of, across, of, of Americans across a business, government, community to Ghana, Senegal, and South Africa in 2019 to commemorate that 1400 years of our people being taken across the seas. And he's spoken in the Pan-African Parliament. He's a media and community empowerment strategist. He's a publisher of the Christian Times newspaper and has written several books, magazines, and periodicals. He's been involved in his community uh, basically all his time, all his life. He's worked with small businesses, community organizations, big corporations to bring resources and impact to local communities. His clients have included Macy's, where many of you have gone to shop, mm -hmm. McDonald's, where many of you have gone to eat, Chase, where many of you have lost money, <laughs> Citibank, where many of us have lost money, 
triple a daily news and a host of other corporations and small businesses he serves on several boards including the greater harlem chamber of commerce which is close to most of our hearts reverend i lived for a while on 136 there and is a global convener as i've said of the door of our hotel he's received a number of awards and has been recently recognized as one of the top 10 New York leaders alongside the Reverend Al Sharpton and New York Governor Cuomo. Reverend Dennis Dillion is married and blessed with five children and five grandchildren. That's the most important part. You are blessed, Reverend. Please, over to you. Advocate uh, Majanku, thank you so much for your kind uh, introduction and, and, and your spirit. And just, I'm grateful uh, for this uh, consultative uh, conference and this very key and critical agenda, especially now. We're holding on in, in the United States. We're remaining strong and steadfast uh, to your point. Uh, we do recognize that there is still a, a, a billow of, of hate um, in, in these United States of America. And uh, we're grateful um, on the other side is uh, for those who are serious about love and the way forward. So we're, we're pressing on and we're confident that the purposes and the will of God will be fulfilled. Um, through this election in these United States of America. I want to take a quick moment uh, to salute the conveners, uh, Reverend Dr. Frank uh, Chikani, and um, certainly hearing uh, Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker uh, Smith yesterday as I was uh, joined in. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a journey that we're on. And uh, as we're in the midst of this COVID crisis um, in the world, um, uh, interestingly, it's, it's, it's crown virus. Uh, the, the virus is actually called crown virus, a virus that um, have had its greatest impact um, in uh, the crown states that colonize Africa. Um, we, we tend to overlook that. Um, where it started, um, there was very little impact in China when it got to Europe um, and it hit these crown states. Um, uh, interestingly enough, Belgium, one of the smallest countries in Europe, had the greatest um, and highest percentage of death per capita as it relates to the coronavirus. It's not by accident that little Belgium uh, is this impacted as it resurged in these regions. Belgium did uh, some of the most devastating things uh, to Central Africa. I, I do not believe that any of this is by accident. I don't think it's by accident either that after 400 years of enslavement, entrapment, uh, colonization um, in the United States of America, and there's a scripture in the Bible uh, in Genesis that talks about the fact that after 400 years, God says, I will punish the nations that enslave them that we come back to um, America just a year after, and we're seeing what's happening across these United States of America. I wanna uh, speak very briefly to this very key topic about, about uh, the, the road ahead and what's next for, um, for Africa. Africa is extremely strategic and poised um, as a continent uh, to the point that was shared earlier. Um, uh, Africa, the fastest growing continent of all the continents uh, in, in the world. Uh, Africa, the continent with the youngest population uh, by uh, 2050, according to uh, the United Nations, uh, Africa, we will experience a 100% um, or, or close growth in its population where we will see a total, almost a 100% uh, stagnation in the European population. So we're not only dealing with the, uh, European fear 
um, and, and white fear in America and elsewhere, but we're most certainly dealing with the, the fact that uh, Africa is on the rise. There's an Africa revival. What we need to make sure is that this revival, um, yes, must have a spiritual roots, a spiritual foundation, but this revival must have economic impact. And there must be a commitment on the part of Africa and Africans to journey to that place where we're dealing with economic liberation. So I want to share just very briefly seven key um, elements and points, which is a part of this Door of Our Return initiative and agenda that will help to bring this about. Number one, um, we, we must uh, break and dismiss the emotional and psychological uh, beliefs and assertions about Africa. Um, Africa is strong, Africa is well, Africa is progressive, Africa is rich, Africa is not poor. Uh, we have to break those negative perceptions and those negative stereotypes. In the interest of time, number two very quickly is what what has happened after World War I and World War II that the rest of the world has done, particularly Europe and America, in doing the world's fear to bring back economic growth and economic revival is the same thing that we must do with Africa. So a big part of what must happen um, at the conference next year as we move from the, the, the Manchester uh, conference, uh, which had great participation when I reflect uh, on people like, like Amy um, uh, Garvey, uh, the, 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 the mother of the great uh, Julius, Dr. Julius Garvey, and his great father, Marcus Messiah Garvey, and W.E.B. Du Bois, who at the time was 77 years old, who was a part of the the whole foundation of the Pan-African Congress and the Pan-African Revival, going back to what he did in 1919, it is so critical that we now have the Africa world's fear. We must look at that, we must project that, and we must look to the top African business leaders, um, the corporate leaders, the multimillionaires and billionaires, to all come together around an Africa world sphere that is designed to bring Africa together, this time not just politically, not just with a political agenda, but most certainly with an economic agenda. Number three, very quickly, is travel and tourism. There must be a commitment on the part of Africa to strengthen its tourism resource. Um, and the fact that Africans in America are among the most traveled uh, Americans, um, not just in America itself, but certainly in the Americas, Canada and uh, uh, South America, the Caribbean, we must now begin to create the relationship whereby more Africans outside of Africa are traveling to Africa for leisure and for business the same way we're traveling for humanitarian causes so that we're lifting the perception of Africa that Africa is not just a place you go to deliver aid but Africa is a place you go to do business it's a place you go to enjoy yourself to relax and to have vacation then number four very quickly we must begin to look at the power of the African youth across the diaspora not only is the youngest population in, in of all the continents in, in, in Africa, but we must also know that the youngest population in the United States of America, according to the US census, happens to be black young people. So wow, there's a huge energy that is global and we must begin to exhaust that and utilize that as well. So there obviously must be the solid commitment to a youth movement. Then we must begin to re-promote and, and rebrand Africa. We must rebrand the Africa we want. There must be a commitment to this rebranding of Africa. So the same way we have a brand South Africa, we need need a brand Africa, and there must be a serious and a solid commitment so that we're rebranding 
Africa and we have the responsibility to lift the image. We must know that when the American media, when the European media, and when the global media begin to shoot and to place their camera in Africa, they're going in to show dis dismay. They're going in to show despondency. They're going in to show decay. We must go in and shine our camera to show the beauty, the glory, the strength, and the power of the Africa that is, but more so the Africa we want. Then there must be a new global church movement, number six. This global church movement must begin to turn uh, things around. Let me quickly explain. The same way we have had um, other churches in Europe and in America coming into Africa as missionaries, and in the end, they are now getting Africans to form and to join their denominations. And when Africans leave Africa and come to America, they're looking for the Assemblies of God Church. They're looking for the white denominations. It is the same way the Black church in America must begin to form those kind of relationships. So the National Baptist Convention that, that Reverend Angelique talked about yesterday need a stronger presence in Africa. The, the Amy Zion, the Amy Church, the, the, the Church of God in Christ uh, needs stronger presence. And when we flip this around, then all of the strong church groups like the Redeemed Church of God in Nigeria and the other churches that are African run and operated on the continent need now to have their presence in America so that there's a global church movement that can now not just have a spirit foundation, but begin to have economic impact as we journey on. Finally, in the interest of time, let me move to a critical final point, and that is we must strengthen our commitment to break the economic strangulation that's on Africa. We must begin to challenge Europe to take its, its knees uh, out of the, the neck of Africa economically. So we begin to break this economic strangulation. And as we move to break this economic strangulation, we begin to create a revival among African businesses. So Africans in America, in the Americas, should be able to go to their supermarket and they can get Dan Goti flour. We should be able to get Dan Goti pasta. We should be able to look at some of the other areas that we're talking about. We should be able to go to our service station, our petrol station, and buy petrol that is from African companies. So there has to be this economic partnership, this economic transformation, and this economic development. And then, as it relates to these five R's, I I want to quickly speak to repentance, restitution, reparations, restoration for revival. So for, um, uh, for Africa to have the kind of revival, the same thing we've seen with the Jews, the same way the Jews got reparation that has created this new economic revival um, amongst uh, Israel and the people of Israel is the same way we must challenge those who are saying they are repenting of, of, of strangulation. They are repenting of what they have done to Africa. We must say with repentance, there must be restitution, which means give back what you took from us. There must be reparations, repair the damage that resulted from what you have taken from us. And then we can talk about restoration and it will affect and bring about the revival that we are talking about. So we must begin to understand that Africa is home. We must work together to effect this. And in the end, it is so key that while we are rising and moving, and I'm grateful for all the spiritual leaders and the faith leaders that are on this call to understand that we cannot experience true spiritual growth and transformation, true repentance, whether it is in Africa or it's in Europe or elsewhere, without going through this five our process, which is truly a path to facilitate Africa's economic revival, repentance, restitutions, restitution, reparation, restoration to effect the Africa revival, which certainly gives us the Africa we need. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rev. I, I mean, I couldn't stop that. So you've got a, a, I've raised my hand when we talk restitution and we will start with the Haitians who were made to pay for their own uh, uh, freedom from slavery and both France and America has to pay for that. So I, I've raised my hand, I'm a lawyer and I'm in that group that says restitution, reparations, and then we would come to revival. Thank you. I couldn't stop you. There was no way I could stop you. This is unbelievable. Thank you so much for that. And uh, it's, it's impossible to try and summarize it. I think you've given us our marching orders like they were given in 1945, you know? <laughs> as, as you know, Dubois told us that the, the problem of the 20th century was one of race. And uh, we will hear from the young ones whether it still is. Mm. But they must also tell us what they are going to do about it. You've given us our seven, seven marching orders. And uh, let us hear, let, it's not my day today. I will have my day another day. Uh, so we are going to discuss your input as well at some time today, after we hear from the young ones and how they respond to your challenge. Can we move to, to our panel? which is five young people who are going to talk to us about the Africa we all want. We're still around. We also want that Africa. But more importantly, it's their Africa. And they must tell us how they are going to do it practically. I forgot at the beginning, and uh, since there are quite a number of uh, men and women of faith on this panel, I think they would uh, help me to get forgiveness for not welcoming our sister first, uh, Reverend Angelique, and and my brother, Reverend uh, Frank Chikani. He's he's a brother, so I can I can be informal with him. But thank you very much for joining us. Okay, we move to the young ones. The first one. Uh, uh, was a respondent yesterday, but today he's going to speak. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Adim Pierre Afuda. I don't know, Pierre, why they say you are both Beninois and Moroccan, but uh, you are Beninese, you are a Beninese nationality, you hold that, but you have a PhD in international relations from Tangier, Morocco. Yeah, and you've been since 2015. Uh, uh, Pierre has been a professor of international relations and international cooperation at the University of Tangier in Morocco. He's also an associate researcher at uh, Research Center Think Tank Civic Academy for Africa's Future, based in Cotonou, Benin. Is an author of several scientific articles as, long, as well as collective works. And, uh, but he's very involved in the church as well, which is very good. And uh, since 2013, he has been the president of the council of the church of Tangier. Pierre, you have five minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, but you know, because you are young, I could reduce it from 10 uh, to maybe from to with, with minute. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, bonjour à tout le monde. 
Et merci pour le, le privilège et l'honneur que vous m'accordez pour pouvoir assister à cette excellente et, et belle conférence. Et je tiens donc à, à remercier tous les organisateurs de, de cette table ronde, de, de cette conférence. Alors, nous allons évoquer rapidement euh, l'Afrique que la jeunesse africaine souhaite, l'Afrique que nous voulons voir dans les années euh, à venir. Rapidement, je vais parler, je vais introduire, donner quelques indications. Give some indications about the youth African youth. Then I will speak about the characteristics of that youth. And the two points, I will put focus on the political challenges and the socio-economical challenges for the youth in the coming years. And I will end with a conclusion. Since the time is short, I will directly go to the introduction. I will introduce here some indicators. First of all, you know that Africa, in some years, is faced with a challenge, demographic challenge, in comparison with the other continents of the world, The African demography is increasing, it's fast increasing. For example, in some countries such as Niger, Mali, there are families which can have seven children by family. So this causes a high increase of the demography of the population in Africa. And it is estimated that in 2050, that means in 30 years, 50% of the African population, that means half of the African population will be around two and a half billion. Half of that population will be less than 25 years of age. It is also estimated that by 2030, that means in 10 years, about 30 million of youth will be on the market looking for employment. So with those indicators, push us to... Nous devrions agir. Nos pays doivent okay. agir. L'Afrique doit agir. Our countries must act now to meet some needs, which are needs very important. It may be on the level of education, health, hospital, building, and so on. This is very urgent and very important. What are the characteristics of the African youth? We noticed that most of the youth who were et ensuite ces jeunes là sont working mainly in the informal sector and they are underemployed many of them are, because they, the, the work they are doing don't help them to meet their daily needs so they are precarious employment which can end from one day to another which can last only for two months and so so they are in precarious or uncertain employment and this causes poverty in the youth class. So the youth, the African youth is characterized by very high poverty, rampant poverty because of underemployment and precarious employment. C'est la rupture, ce que j'appelle la rupture du contrat social. Another aspect that characterizes the African youth is the break of the social contract between the governors and the governed people. It's important to know it because the youth don't trust the governing bodies anymore. We have in our countries, our leaders who don't take into account the aspirations of the youth. So today, the youth seems not to trust the governors. So there is a break between the governors and the governed. And this causes, so the youth are isolated from the political management of their country. They are not involved. And we say they are half, almost half of the population, but they are not involved in the process of decision making in, and management. And the consequence uh, resulting from that is that we have many young people who try to move migration from the rural areas, areas where there is no social services, where no employment, they move towards the urban areas. And in most cases, African countries, people are concentrated in one or two cities. This is the result of the abandonment uh, by the authorities, by the governors, 
of a great part of the population. And to that movement within the country, there is also forced migration. I mean, Morocco, in Tanger, since 15 years, and every year there are millions of people who come from Sub Saharan Africa, thousands and hundreds of people. I am 15 kilometers from Spain. So there are thousands of people who are in the forest nearby with the hope to cross over, uh, to cross the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean Sea to go and look for better life in Spain, which is less than 15 kilometers from the Tangier city where I live. These are consequences of bad management and the exclusion of the youth by the public power uh, from our governance. So those are some indicators. What are now the challenges for the future? What the, the political decide must do? The youth must be integrated in the local and national management. We have to find strategies to in involve the youth in the management of their country. Secondly, the public power should create a political and institutional framework which is favorable to investment and the creation of employment. When I'm here, when I meet those young people coming from Cameroon, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Senegal, from all countries, I ask them, why are you coming? They always say, we have no employment. We prefer to die in the Mediterranean Sea rather than stay in our countries and die of hunger. So if we stay, we are going to die. So the public power has to create conditions so that there may be investment and employment. We need also uh, strategies which are necessary for valuing the transfers from the African diaspora towards productive investment. As it was said yesterday, the African diaspora financially contributes on what we have in Africa as public health to development of the great countries. So there is a need to orientate that contribution towards investment which are productive. That means diaspora can contribute to the development of our countries. There are, as I said, there are millions of young Africans who are everywhere in the world who have to find strategies for the, those young people to participate in the development of their country through those productive investments. Finally, I will I talk about Morocco. Morocco created institutions to enable the Morocco diaspora, which is, for instance, in Morocco, there are about 4 million who are in Morocco. There are millions of Moroccan people who come back to their country. There are strategies to enable them to invest and to participate in the management of their country. This is an interesting example that African countries can also experience to value the youth which is out of the continent. Now, on the economical level and social level, we need our governors to have uh, provide for pro uh, vocational training which, which are adapt adapted to the productive system. There are people in Africa, in Africa who have doctorate in different areas, in economy, in mathematics, in physics, but who are not able, for instance, to make a pen, who are not able to, to, to make medicine, or everything, medicine, the pens we use, even what we consume, it comes from outside, it comes from Asia, from China, from Europe. This is not normal. Our training must be adapted to our needs. And for that, our countries, must support research and innovation. The governing bodies must be aware of that to support research. That is what is missing, investment, research, which should be supported. That is what will contribute for the youth, so that the, the training must meet the expectations and the needs of our countries. And then, there is a need pro, uh, programs of accompaniment and support to the youth for the creation of enterprise and innovation. The youth have a lot of ideas. So those ideas have to be valued. There are youth who want to start something. They must be accompanied. 
they must be supported by providing them, for example, access to credit, to finances, so that those ideas may be translated or converted by achievement, by in small enterprises, which, can, which could be created. Everywhere in the world today, the state cannot provide employment to all the youth, which comes every day on the market. The state cannot do it. So if it cannot do it, then it is necessary to, to, decide, to decide on policies and means which will help the youth to get access to credit and finances so that they can achieve their dreams and uh, meet their challenges and create enterprises that they want. That is what will give employment. That is what will save Africa in the coming decades. Finally, I propose uh, a kind of Erasmus for the entrepreneur in Africa, a system which will help the youth, the African youth, wherever they are on the Africa, to meet, to meet, to make exchanges, to share experiences, and uh, to provide knowledge and the know-how, and share the different experiences which have been accumulated here and there. This will help those youth to have different prospects and other ideas and other types of way of thinking which will help them to change a, a certain number of things in their way of managing and leading uh, the life of enterprises and so on. Those are some ideas that, and proposals that I make to enable our youth to have hope for the coming years. Since the time is short, I will conclude by this sentence, which is very important, which says, relying on the African youth is relying on the future of the continent. In other words, investing today in the African youth is investing for a better future of our continent that we like so much. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to share some points, some the perspectives, which I hope will help, will be converted in action in, in, the, in the future years, so that things may change in our continent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. I hope you don't mind me being so informal with you. Uh, thank you very much. I think what you've said ties in very well with what Reverend Dillion said, because he, he gave us a, a number of proposals that it's time now for African business to thrive. And the way we do it is to, to make sure that we, we strengthen our cooperation between the diaspora and, and African businesses and, and, and challenge the economic strangulation that comes from, from our former uh, colonizers. So we, we need to start thinking about how we break that challenge and that strangulation that our former colonizers have on us to make sure that we can cooperate better amongst ourselves. And I think this is what uh, the, the, the program that Reverend Dillion leads is trying to do. I hope that this time we will get it right, not just talk about it, but but make sure that it happens. At least we must start and we must see it starting. Uh, uh, without uh, wasting time, I'm going to move on to call on Ms. Ria williams Ayada to speak to us. Uh, Ria is from South Sudan. She founded a, an organization called Crown the woman, South Sudan. Uh, she's a TED speaker. She's, she's addressed the UN General Assembly and initiated a campaign called South Sudanese Girls and Women Are Born to Lead. And we know they are. Of course, we agree with you, Ria. And uh, she's a uh, She's got a woman, a movement that aims at advocating for more women in different leadership positions 
especially at all levels of government and participating in peace and high level uh, uh, peace issues led by the IGAD process. IGAD is a Central African uh, 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 regional uh, organization of the AU that gets involved in peace and has been leading the, the peace processes in North and South Sudan. Now, because Ria, Ria is a woman and I'm chairing this session, I'm facilitating, nobody can overrule me. She gets more time. As women, we've been over, we've been oppressed for so long. So now that we are in control, I give her more time. So Ria, you've got one more minute than Pierre. Over to you. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm so humbled to be in this uh, conference, and uh, I'm happy to be speaking here. My name is Ria William Uyada, just like I've been in. Um, my name is Ria, and uh, I come from South Sudan. I am a women's human rights and peace activist, and I'm happy to be here. And um, when I was invited to speak for this conference, I was thinking about what is it that I'm going to say that needs to be said because so many people have been saying things, but are, are they changing? Are we moving? Uh, are, we, are we changing for the better? Uh, the previous speakers have shared a lot of aspirations for Africa. And as a young woman, I, I grow in fear of what may happen to the Africa that we want if we do not work together to fix it. Um, I am currently in Juba and I work a lot on building peace at a grassroots level, working with young women and women in general to push for peace in South Sudan. For those who don't know South Sudan, South Sudan is the youngest uh, country on the continent and uh, still striving to attain peace uh, as well. So for me as a young woman, I have been also reflecting on the agenda 2063 and uh, I was asking how many years do we have to look at that if we have achieved or not. And we are just 43 years away from Agenda 2063. But what have we achieved? Looking at what is happening currently on the continent, I fear that we may not get the Africa that we want. Uh, with the COVID-19 and the pandemic, I see different news. Uh, I see in Nigeria, I see in Uganda, I see in different parts of the world, in Kenya, there's so much happening, uh, so much violence happening on this continent that makes me to fear as a young woman what could happen if we do not do or if we do not come together to do something about it. Um, and for me as a young woman, I, have, I was born in, in South Sudan and I had to leave to live in Uganda as a refugee uh, because of the war. And uh, now I came back to South Sudan and still working to build peace, but there is still war in my country. And even right now, I'm asking myself, is this where you want to stay, Ria? And I'm thinking, where, where next are you going to run? And this is not the Africa I want. I don't want to produce my children in war. I, I was born in war, and I don't want to produce my children in war. So the Africa that I aspire for is the Africa that is free from violence. And when I speak about violence, I speak about gun violence. I speak about other forms of violence, like sexual violence. Uh, recently in South Sudan, we have been battling and speaking against uh, sexual violence, right? Rape. We have instances where children, girls as young as eight years are raped. Uh, we recently protested on the streets where there was a gang rape of an eight-year-old girl. And this is not the Africa I want. I've also seen Nigerians coming together to protest uh, sexual violence in their country. And it is like growing everywhere and every day. So I want an Africa where we are free from violence and free from sexual violence. Um, I want an Africa where we, the young people, are considered as leaders and not told to wait for our time. I come from a country which is very young and uh, we are still talking about revitalizing the country. We are still talking about uh, formation of a new government. But when we see the government that is being formed, it's a government of all the people. When we speak about women's, uh, women's representation, 
uh, I, I have been part of a peace process. We've been pushing for affirmative action for women and we've moved from 25 to 35%. But seeing that it's mainly the old women. And if we, the young women speak up, we are told, wait for your time. Wait, sit down and wait for your time. And I'm wondering by the time I'm old, that will I be telling the other young women, wait for your time as I sit in that chair? That's not the Africa I want. I want an Africa where uh, women are in leadership but as well holding on to other young women to nurture them to take on spaces and be in leadership as well. And that is through mentorship. Um, I want an Africa that is creating jobs for its people rather than pushing the people to the diaspora. We are speaking about Africans in Africa and diaspora, but we are forgetting to ask questions of why are Africans leaving the continent into other countries and they are becoming Africans in the diaspora. You know, We should be questioning what is it that we can do for the Africans who are on the continent, not to run away, create better jobs, uh, invest in young people, invest in businesses in the economy of people who are already doing something. I have seen, I don't know if it's a case elsewhere, which I've seen is we are seeing so much influx of foreigners like Chinese. I mean, I don't, I am, I am complaining about this because most companies are, are being laid out or products are being produced by Chinese and the ones which are produced locally are not being invested in or are not being promoted. I want an Africa where production is locally and also uh, cherished rather than looking at things that are coming from outside and oppressing the ones that are already happening. Um, I want an Africa where rule of law is respected. We have seen so many people uh, who are killing others. We have seen so many leaders who are staying long in power, but they're not being held accountable at all, even when they leave there will never be a question of what have you done. We've seen corruption everywhere. If you look at Kenya, if you look at even in my own country, South Sudan, but no one is holding them accountable. I want an Africa where even we hold each other, we hold leaders accountable and ask them, you're leading us. What have you done with our, with our incomes and our taxes? Um, I want an Africa where the women peace and security agenda is number one top priority, where I don't have to beg uh, as, a, as a woman for my, for, for, to be spoken about, or I want to, to be the one to speak on my issues rather than someone else speaking up, speaking up for me. Um, I want an Africa where we have freedom of movement. You know, I have said I, I wasn't a refugee. I moved from South Sudan to Uganda and coming back to South Sudan and holding the South Sudanese passport, it's like, it's a crime. When I go to countries like South Africa, I'll be asked, where are you from? I say I'm from South Sudan. The first question I'll be asked, why are you fighting? You know, they will not even, they do not know that Ria is in South Sudan fighting to ensure that we have peace hold in South Sudan. But they'll ask me, why are you fighting? Like as if I'm done holding the gun to fight. So I want that Africa that is welcoming uh, rather than questioning, question me, but also find out what is she doing than questioning uh, why are you fighting and all this. So I want an Africa where there is freedom of movement, where I don't have to, to fight to get a visa, uh, make, the, make the processes easier uh, for us. Finally, I'm just going to, to stop and just conclude by saying that um, we should stop making resolutions as Africans but rather start implementing the ones that we have. We have amazing uh, resolutions. We have amazing human rights uh, tools. We have, for example, the Maputo Protocol and all these tools, but we are not implementing. Why are we starting new ones? Let us settle and implement the old ones and then the rest will fall in place. I want an Africa that is peaceful and that is it. Thank you. Uh, if we were not on uh, on Zoom, we would go. Yes, there she goes. I am sure that uh, we will come back to your to your presentation, Ria. The participants have heard you. I mean, you you really put us to shame to say you know. Africa decided in that 2020 is the year that we would have silenced the guns. But as we speak, there's a, there was a coup in Mali. Uh, there is an ongoing violence in Cote d'Ivoire. Guinea, there was violence in Guinea as we speak. 
you know, Sudan is still not settled. Uh, after the elections in Tanzania, there was a bit of problems. The opposition members were arrested in, in Mozambique. In the north of Mozambique, there are, there's restlessness. There. And we said that this year is the year that we would have silenced the guns. So, I mean, when you say to us, the older ones, that I don't want to raise my children in war. I was born in war and I grew up in war. That really, really touched a raw nerve in some of us who have been trying our best to work for peace on the African continent. So I, I think you've put a challenge on the table. And can, let me tell you, this is your time. You have the right to speak and you have every right to speak in your own voice, not through somebody's voice. But uh, I think the participants will have more to say about it. You really said to us, you know, where next, what happens? And, uh, but it's people like you who are going to take this, this Africa forward and tell us, some of us old ones to back off. And, and I'm sure you can start a global movement. I was talking to young people in Ivory Coast just yesterday who say enough is enough. But anyway, let me stop there. But you really, really touched us. Uh, when you say you were born in war and grew up in war, you don't want that for your children. None of us want that for your children. And we must make sure it doesn't happen. Thank you very much, Ria. We'll come back to your input. I'm going to move on. I move on now to Osman. Osman uh, is a young, young uh, participant who joins us online. And he is from, uh, Osman is from Gambia. Uh, he, he's, uh, he holds several certificate in developmental studies, sustainable development goals, global health, and he's got a recent postgraduate training certificate in leadership from Rwanda. He's a member of the Professor Lumumba's uh, PLO Lumumba Foundation in Kenya. He's been on the list of the most outstanding students in all schools that he Uh, but he's also a community worker, you know, voluntary teaching in different schools. And currently he's serving as a program officer for Wings of Hope, the Gambia, which is a voluntary organization. Uh, Osman, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I am so glad to be in this platform. I'm so happy because this is a platform where myself as a very young individual is listened to by people who have been there way before us. And today we are talking about the Manchester conference. We are talking about Africans in Africa. We are talking about Africa as a continent and we are talking about the diasporians. And as we speak in 1945, when the Manchester conference was held, Around the same time, the Britain Wood institutions were formed. And that is the IMF, the World Bank, the United States joined European countries to extend their programs in the African continent through these institutions to use financial traps in which African leaders, they are aware of it, but they deliberately neglect their people for financial gain through these institutions. Today, we have to speak about African independence because that is the most important thing. Africa as a continent need to stand on its own to tailor its own development and then to implement it. But then 
what we experienced in the past is that Africa has not been able to do anything without the intervention of European countries, America and China. And this have marginalized the human resources of this continent. It has exploited the mineral resources of this continent and it has prevent Africa from registering the development that it ought to take. In the words of Samir Amin, Africa needed to delink itself in order to be independent enough to determine its own destiny. When Asian countries took a step like this, they were a laughing stock that their development will not be sustainable. And in the words of Lee Kuan, the founder of uh, Singapore's uh, independence and the first prime minister, he said he was building powers and people. And powers and people is what led Singapore to where it is today. Singapore and my own country, the Gambia, gained independence in 1965. All struggling nations, and where is Singapore today and where is the Gambia? So somehow down the line, Africa has been trapped with measures, with strategies by Western powers and made it very difficult for us to develop and register our development. So what is the future for this continent? Africa must realize that its development lies in the hands of its people. There is no way that we can import the genuine revolution that is going to register the development for this continent. We can keep importing food. We can keep importing the water that we drink and everything. But a revolution that will change the status quo of this continent cannot be imported. It has to come from within. And the beginning of that is equipping the Africans with skills, with knowledge, with that self-patriotism, that belief that Africa as a continent has to take its own destiny in its hand that belief that Africa has a civilization, that belief that Africa has a history, and then we can save the future that we want. The education system in Africa has been another instrument used by Westerners in order to tap this continent on the way it is today, that we are not equipped with the quality of knowledge and skills that are going to drive the African agenda forward. At the same time, that self-patriotism that we need to have, that history and understanding of the same African reality is not in place. They've also made sure that the borders that were demarcated back in 1884, 1885 in, the, in Berlin, the same borders not only just continue to be, but then it happens in our own individual level where I, as a Gambian, finds it difficult to understand my sister from South Sudan, where an individual from South Sudan finds it difficult to understand a brother or a sister from Sudan, that we have this identity problem, that we don't see ourselves as a people. We don't see ourselves as people that belongs to the same continent. And then we see ourselves based on our tribes. We see ourselves based on our meaningless borders, and nationalities, and we cannot move on if we do not have a market base where Africans can integrate among ourselves, where Africans can meet and discuss through platforms about African issues and drive the African agenda forward. Recently, Africa have signed the Free Trade Agreement, which is a milestone in regional integration, but we, it is now in documents, but we still face with the problem of implementation. Africa for far too long never have a problem of designing beautiful policies. Our problem has been implementation. And our problem has been in the policies that we adopt as to how do we make sure that we have this comparative public policies among African states? How do we make sure that we have a market among African economies where Africans can meet trade among ourselves, build up platforms where Africa can launch African problems and tailor a solution to that? This has always been some of the problems that we face as a continent. And if we want to build the Africa that we want, an Africa that is free from poverty, an Africa that has a good infrastructure before 2063, an Africa that has a modern agricultural system, an, Af an Africa that equips its individuals with human power, 
with human capacity, with human dignity, with human respect for that, wherever the African is, they can be recognized, they can be respected, and they can be observed as equal to any other race. We have to set the pattern for our own development. We cannot have, continue to rely on others to do this for us. And the solution to the African problem, in my view, is going back to visit the Pan-African agenda. Marcos Gave had a dream. Marcos Gave had an agenda. And he said in his days that any leadership that teaches you to depend on another race for survival, that leadership will enslave you. And that is what Africa have been living on for far too long. Our leaders have not taught us anything other than depending on the Western world, depending on the Americans, depending on the Chinese for survival. Is there any sustainable development in that? In order to build the future that we want, Africa must lay down its foundational priorities. What do we need to attend and how do we go by that? Protecting this generation, protecting the future generation, protecting the environment in Africa, making sure that the African resources are processed in the continent, making sure that the African resources we have built factories, we built industries, starting with the local ones that we have. For if we start producing the belts that we use, if we start producing the shoes that we put on, if we start producing the clothes that we put on, then therefore we will have the control in the future because everything has a beginning and we have to focus on this. But these are little things that we do not control. And today what Africa feeds the world is nothing but raw materials. Africa is blessed with oils, but who benefit from this oil? We talked about the coal town. Who are those suffering today in the continent? The most and the poorest people that you can meet in the African continent are people living in resource-centered areas. And that is happening because they are neglected by their own leaders. At the same time, leaders are serving as comparable groups where institutions in the US and Europe, China, whatsoever, impose individuals on us. And then instead of serving the interests of the people, they're serving the interests of the people, of, of those Westerners, those so-called powers who support them in the continent. We have to do away from this. And going back again on a final note, Africa must design its own curriculum. We have to try and feed the African youths with that patriotism, with that sense of belongingness, with that unity and love in our education system, recognizing the African as a brother and as a sister so that we can move the agenda forward. Because the first step is African unity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Usman. I'm getting more and more excited as I listen to the young people. I think we have a future here. Thank you so much for reminding us that Africa has a history. Africa has a, a civilization, you know, because sometimes, even though Dr. Pichana yesterday said we must stop looking at the back, sometimes we forget that we come from great, great uh, civilization. And uh, some, some, you know, the, the slavery period, the colonization period, uh, you know, uh, really accounts for about 500 years of, of our lives. Whereas before that, we, we had great kingdoms and, and great civilizations. Uh, thanks for reminding us of that because it's important to remember that when, when you need to deal with sense of self-doubt, to know that before slavery, before colonialism, before neocolonialism, we were some, you know, in some areas we had great civilization. And as we plan, as you young people plan on the way forward, you need to know that it's possible because we've been great before. But you are right about raising some of the challenges that, that we face now. Thank you very much. We'll come back to your, to your input. May I then move to uh, another young sister? And I will move to Ngimu, Victorine, Chonuk, 
Kuno from Cameroon. Ngimu is a 20-year-old rights activist with over six years, I like that, over six years of experience campaigning and advocating for the advancement of girls' education and clean water, sanitation, and hygienic environment for the young women in and out of schools. Very important project. A journey which began in 2014 when she witnessed the horrendous trauma experienced by her cousin forced into marriage at the age of 14. She could not be silent when she saw that. And with support from the organization Women for a Change, her cousin was able to gain her liberation and freedom and is now back to school and living her dreams. You can tell that Ngumo is a doer and I am very, very happy to invite her to address us. Over to you. Because you also you are a woman, you got an extra minute. Go ahead. Okay, greetings to all, be it good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Once more, I'm very, very happy to be here. I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to express myself in this wonderful platform. As you lightly said, my name is Ndimu Victorine Tronkono from Cameroon, an adolescent with Women for a Change Cameroon, and at the same time, one of their young leader in a group an adolescent-led group known as Mifali. I'm sure most of us must be aware of it because we're all over the internet. We do campaigns on Twitter, Facebook, and Zoom. So I'm very happy to be here to be presenting some of the problems us the Africans are facing and what we want as African in our country, Africa. First, African, my brother ended with unity. I would love to start from that point. That is a very good point, I must say. When we talk of unity, unity is Africa's biggest problem. Division in Africa as well. The, the lawmakers, that's the government, the ministers, the president, in fact, the officials, they don't have this cordial relationship with their citizen. We say what we want, but at the end of the day, they do what they feel is best for us. We don't want that in Africa. That is division, and which is one of the biggest problems in Af Africa. What we want is unity. We want to be united with our decision makers. We want to be united with the lawmakers. That way, they could know our problem and know how to start with it. Let's move forward. Also, we have to be Africans that are proud of what we have, our natural resources. We should stop trying to copy from the Western, from the Western world. We are good in, we have many things. We have raw materials. We have raw materials, we have road, we have all those good things put in place, economical structure. We should be proud of them rather than trying to copy from the Western world because at times copying from a Western world is going to slow down our own economic and development. Just like, let's take for example, we have American, Asia, and the European. They develop on their own. We have to develop in our own ways because we have our own nat nature. If we keep trying to imitate others, it will only slow us down as the way to our development is if we grow up in our own ways and nature. And all of us here as Africans are aware. To continue, I would love to talk about high standards of living, quality of life, and well-being of all. Most of us talked about poverty, but there's something I would love to emphasize about it. Ending poverty, inequality, us girls, young women, we face that a lot. We face inequality in a lot of things. Ending inequality and inequality in income and opportunities. Job creation, especially addressing youth unemployment. Us as youth, we find out that many of us, after being able to graduate, the next thing that comes in mind is to leave country, to look for a better job and earn something. For us, and this also tends to discourage most of our sponsors, like our parents, because from looking at home, our elder ones who have been able to graduate from the university, what do they do? The country have nothing to offer. The, the only thing they could do is to join their parents or their sponsors in the petit petit trading that they do to survive the house. So with our parents looking at this, saying, this is my child, I spent a lot of money on you making sure 
you have the education, the proper education you, you are supposed to have so that tomorrow you could help me and in return help your junior ones. But it's, it's not like that. It turns out to discourage our parents and sponsor from sending us, the younger generation, to acquire this education because they feel that it is a circle of life. Once we are, we are done with education, we are still going to come back at Just move around a little bit, Ngumo. We, lost we have electricity, providing social security and protection. We can't do anything when we don't have protection. Let's take, for example, others have spoken about their country. I would love to speak about mine, Cameroon. Currently, we can't go to school. Just last week in the Southwest, that it mostly happened in the English speaking region of our country, that's the Northwest and the Southwest. People were brutally killed. Children went they, they went to school, they were they were gone short, people were killed, parents died just from getting the news that your only son or your only daughter has been brutally killed in school, or because he or she wants to gain education. Just yesterday, there was still another attack, still in the Southwest region, where armed men with guns went to schools burn part of the school, ask the students and teachers, they were well flogged and they were asked to naked, completely naked. And they, while doing this, they had to record it and send it on social media. Imagine you as an adolescent, as a girl, as a parent, you're struggling to gain education. And at the end of the day, your pictures, your videos, it, it, it's everywhere on social media, all in the name of seeking for education. We don't have peace. We don't have security. All this cares us. Look at us. Some of us are still at home. Not that we can't go to school, but we're thinking that what if it gets to where I am? What if it reached me? What will happen to me? What will be my story? Who is going to live to tell my story? Imagine you sit at home and you see your daughter on the screen, maybe on social media, running naked. That had, she had been naked by some grown men, all in the name of because she's seeking education. They don't want them to go to school. Why? All this slowdown and development. We are going to school in order to have empowerment so that we could help develop our own country. Like I said, depending or trying to imitate the Western world rather slows down our own economic and development. We have good nature. We have, we have resources, we have everything. And God has blessed us with minimal resources, but yet we can't seem to use it. The, the Chinese are the ones even benefit from what we have. Just like what the other panelists said, if you look the hard down of poverty, where poverty is rooted in Africa, it is from those states where they have the highest minerals and raw material, but yet they can't benefit from it because our government official tends to sell it to other places. Another thing that kills us Africa is health. We need, we need to be healthy, well nurtured. Citizens are, ex, ex, <coughs> us citizens, we don't have good hospitals, clinic, or even enough. At times you want to go to the hospital. When you get there, you need to get up very early. There is a long queue of line. Imagine if you have a very emergency matter that needs to be attended by the doctor. How are you going to end up? You have to stand on a long line. And at times you don't have available doctors in the hospital. One doctor for over 20 patients. How is he going to cope? At the end of the day, he's going to be so tired and exhausted. And maybe if you come, he might maybe look into your matter where it's not supposed to be like that. And more to that, we want a society where the girls in particular, I want to lay emphasis on this point because it touched me a lot, especially as you read from my CV. You see, I'm an activist. And what really prompted me to start into this journey was when I witnessed my younger cousin at the age of 14, forced into early marriage. Okay, us girls, adolescents, we have a funny society whereby us, the girls, are being cornered to the back. The youngest are cornered to not going to school. The young women are cornered to the kitchen or forced marriage. It's not supposed to be like that. Education is our fundamental right. And as girls, we are human. Humans, we, are, we have rights. We are born equally. So it is our right to go to school. It's our right to say, no, I don't want to get married. I want to be educated. My father is not going to use me to have money to spend my to send my brothers in school thinking that I am a girl and if my place is in the kitchen. No, it's not supposed to be like that. We all have rights. We have right to education. I don't want to be cornered in the back. I want to be included in decision making, especially when it concerns me or adolescent or young women. I want to be involved. I want to say, this is what I want. This is how I want it to be. Not you talking for me and doing things for me, whereas I'm alive, I'm strong and I'm healthy. I have all the physical, appearances that you need, I can stand, I can 
represent myself, I can talk, I'm not physically disabled. Even if I was, I am still a human and I have that right to certain access. I want to be included in decision making. I don't want to be beneficiaries of action. No, I want to speak for myself. I want to speak for my peers and I want to say no. Include us in decision making, in policies and in, in politics and in many things. As girls, as adolescents, as African, this is what we want. This is the African we want. We want an Africa where it is peace. Yesterday was my sister that was shot by, that was taken by a stray bullet. What is if I was the one? What if today it is me? Who is going to tell my story? We want peace. We want security. Africa, a lot of us in a lot of countries in Africa are facing crisis. Cameroon, we are facing division problem in the northwest and the southwest, the two English speaking region of my country. Schools are not going on in that area for years, and we are staying at home. We don't want this. This is not the Africa we are dreaming for. This is not the Africa we were promised by our ministers and president when they were taking powers. They promised us that they are going to stand for us. They are going to give us good water. They are going to give us electricity. They are going to give us free education, cheap and accessible to all. But that was not what we got when they assessed that power. We want all those things. Thank you very much. I'll end there. Yeah, that's an activist speaking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nimo. You spoke like a real activist uh, that, that, I, that I know. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. The crisis in Cameroon is known by African leaders. They have known what is happening in the Northwest and the Southwest. And now children are being slaughtered while they are in school. And all that you see is the African Union issuing a statement uh, to, to express regret. But these leaders, I know for a fact that they have known about the situation because we've been involved in, in informing them of the situation in Cameroon. So I'm glad that uh, the, the people on the ground are speaking out about the situation in Cameroon. It is really sad if you see some of the pictures that I get every day from the massacres there, they are really, really bad. But uh, with, with leaders like you, young women who speak out and speak for themselves, where we, have, we really hope that the future will be different uh, from the past. So please stay on and so that people can ask you questions or interact with you. Let me go to the last speaker very quickly. You can switch off your camera. The last speaker on the panel, I know I've got a, a Reverend and Tateha David to just give us, but the last speaker on the panel is a lawyer who is the chief executive of the SADC Lawyers Association, Stanley Nyamanidi, no, Nyamanidi. Sorry, Stanley, uh, I shouldn't pronounce it wrongly. Uh, and uh, he's also vice chairman of the African Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa. He's a, a lawyer in Zimbabwe and has worked uh, a lot at the intersection of civil society, business and government at national and SADC level. He's worked for a law firm in Harare and for the Law Society of Zimbabwe, one campaign, Africa office, and served as a board member of the Zimbabwe Legal Information Institute and the Tree of Life Foundation. Stanley is a 2015 Mandela Washington Fellow and a volunteer under the Lions Club International. Welcome, Stanley, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And <clears throat> as, as the speeches kept coming, kept coming up, and myself being the last speaker, I, I, I'm really tempted to say revolutionary greetings, comrades, because um, yeah. th there has been such energy, and I, I believe and can see the African youth moving, not only to advance themselves, but to take and occupy space. And I can really believe this with the caliber of young people. That, that are speaking in this platform and who are part of the networks that we are developing. And speaking from the Southern African region, uh, I, I just want to, to, to just say that this is just saying that I'm in Southern Africa, but really I'm an African youth. 
the things that all the youths that have been saying that they want are the same things that all of us want here. And, and the, the important thing is that the challenges that the youths are facing have got different facets. They are transformational in nature, they are generational, they are gender-based, they are racial and ethnic-based, they are even geographical. We had the speaker talk about the 1886 Berlin Conference, which gave us artificial borders that make us think that we are different and we are suffering uh, psychologically, but also practically because of this. And the theme that has been very clear is that we need a homogeneous identity as Africans. We need to belong to a school of values that identifies us beyond this vo these borders. And when I'm coming from the Southern African region, one of the key issues that we, the youth, think are suffering from is the lack of evolution from being liberation war movements. The history of colonialism still dogs us. We have generations that fought to, to free us from the shackles of colonialism, but in essence, we now need to get out of the war mode, of the liberation struggle mode, to get into the second level of the, of the fight, which is economic. And I, I dare say that the youth cannot uh, be sidelined any longer. It is important that they not only be included in decision making, but that they must be put in charge of making decisions. The three arms of state, that are the, the, the executive, the judiciary, the parliament, there must be presence of youth, and youth in there must not only have a voice, but must have a final say in, in the decision-making processes. And we talk of so many resources that our, our continent is enriched with, and yet at the end of the day, there is the challenge that they are being taken out raw without finished products, and the profits are not coming to the African soil. But I want to say and challenge uh, the, the, the youth of today to say we not only want to be part of the production process, but we want to own the means of production. Until a youth owns a diamond mine, not only a diamond mine, but a diamond processing uh, 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 factory, uh, until the ore that is mined in Africa is processed and sold as final jewels, as, as final oil uh, uh, that has been uh, put into petrol, that has been put into the final products sold in Africa by youths who are in the full production process from the start to the end, I really think that we wouldn't have started talking about youth empowerment. And um, one of the challenges that we want to address is the fact that there is politics of patronage. Elections in Africa have stopped to produce durable results for democratic and good governance. And youth are being used or are participating without knowledge or ignorantly or negligently in stealing from their own future, helping people whose future is already limited. We think that the generation of the youth must become meaningfully involved in elections. The election process in Africa has got to be re-looked at and we need to have elections that bring the agency of voting, uh, uh, the, the, the franchise of voting and the rights of the people into being. And we're not talking about just before the elections and during the elections because elections have become transactional in many of our borders. We are talking about after elections, there have to be accountability. And speaking from the Southern African perspective, the issue of accountability is really a challenge. We have a situation where we've got disintegrating infrastructure for human rights and rule of law responsiveness in our region. I cite specifically the, 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 the disbandment of the SADC tribunal. This is a tribunal that was there to ensure that individual human rights abuses and uh, accountability for, for governments and people in leadership and those who are entrusted with public resources exists. But uh, this, this capacity and this jurisdiction has been removed. We continue to say we need regional mechanisms to address human rights uh, 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 violations, but more importantly, that youths must be at the center, must be at the center of this. And I really think in terms of education, we look at our resources. What must our youths be taught? Our curriculum has got to become responsive. We need to start to teach our, our youths about producing, about handling the means of production, and also about investing, maintaining, 
value uh, for, for, for future generations. Uh, the thinking that we produce for the now has got to stop, and we have to think in terms of seeding our energy, our human capital, and as youths to demand um, our seat on the, on the table as it were. A great issue that Africa suffers from is the media framing. I have not seen, and I continue to search, for media frameworks that speak the story of the African youth, that speak the story of the African. A good number of the media that we interact with every day on our breakfast table, when we get into the office, when you are driving your car, are not uh, spurred or, or originating from the African perspective. And we worry about the picture of poverty. We worry about the picture of, of, of disease, of failure, that continues to be, to be associated with the future of the African youth. And we need to refuse this and create uh, mediums for telling our own story because we have success stories. And uh, looking at the panel that has been here speaking on behalf of the youth, I am convinced that there is a story that will create role models and produce and provide hope for future generations uh, of youth in, in Africa. And um, as I try to round off, I'm aware that I'm the last speaker, and one of the good things about this is that key points that have been made uh, need only be reinforced or I need only concur. But I want to, to quickly point to the issue of transitional justice. Uh, the, the, the speaker who spoke before the panel of youths was very clear about reparations, uh, you know, and everything there was, was so, so stimulating to my mind. And, and the issue of transitional justice has to be handled correctly. A lot of youths, a lot of people in Africa are, are originating from backgrounds where they have been hurt, where people's uh, uh, self-image and dignity has been taken away from them. How do we transition? from that state of, 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 of existence to a state of existence where our dignity of our people is restored in the most remote parts of our own continent. And, and I, I want to point to, to the great efforts that have been done through some of the organizations here in Southern Africa. There's the Institute uh, for, for, for Study of Violence and, uh, and Reconciliation. They've worked on, a, on, a, on an instrument at AU level for transitional justice. And this is one of the, the key frameworks that we ought to embrace, that we must ensure that our local legislation can, can, can adapt to, can, can actually um, domesticate. And we find meaningful programs for reparations, meaningful programs for transition from, from communities that have been wronged to communities that are confident, that are working at the same level as those who were in the past transgressors and looking forward uh, to receiving the same reward for the same amount of effort. Uh, Madam Chair uh, and everybody else, I rest my case here and thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to join hands and voices with the rest of the Pan-African uh, uh, progressive movement. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stanley. Um, it, it would take a lawyer to say I rest my case. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here and you're absolutely correct that, you know, I felt like starting like you to say Amanda, uh, but, but uh, you know, there's just so much pain, but at the same time, so much hope. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I think, uh, the men and women of the cloth will be able to interpret this for us. Um, just so much pain, and uh, but so much hope. It's not. Uh, it's not for me to 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 try and, and summarize what what has been said and to put it into a workable program. I think we have a a few minutes if. I'm not mistaken to, to look at, at some of the issues that have been raised. I have, a, there, is a, there is a question just to find out the organization, the name of the organization that I think uh, Ngimu spoke about uh, to know which one it is. Uh, but there's a question to all presenters to say, 
how can we start fostering the unity and values that we want so that we start taking Africa in the right direction? How can we start fostering the unity and values that we want so that we start taking Africa in the right direction? The question is, is directed to all presenters. I don't know who wants to take it. Gimo, you can give us the name of your organization first and then start with the question as well. Okay, this is me, Gimo again. The name of my organization is Women for a Change Cameroon. That's FAC, W F A C, FAC. Is it okay? Yes, that's okay. okay. We will also circulate it, yeah. And then on the question, how do we okay. start? Yes, from the question, my own opinion is like I said, one of the last points I concluded in. It is dialogue, inclusion of adolescents, young girls, and women in decision-making. If we start that way, at least the president or, or the arms of the government that are, that are going to know what we want, how we want it, and from there, they will know where to start. That is the unity we want. When we talk of unity, all of us emerge. We need to come together and put our head as one to make Africa the country we want. So by doing that, we need to start including us adolescents young girls and women into decision making that it is for me i don't know if my fellow panelists have something else to add okay does anybody else want to take that question what's the first step what do we take what's the first step usma yes uh thank you so much i think uh when we talk about African unity, or what do we do to foster African unity? She made a very good point. How do we make sure that we integrate and start with having our young uh, women in decision-making bodies? But equally, we have to look into the function of the African Union itself. The Union was established in order to register African unity. And that language of unity has to be well embedded in every decision, in every policy that the African Union is to undertake. Because that is the body where we all look up to for reference as African states. So therefore, we have to make sure that we have mechanisms in which the African Union up there is ready to integrate, I mean, with, with real readiness in for regional integration, making sure that we defeat all these um, restrictions based on borders and etc within the African continent to foster that regional integration among ourselves. And the other thing for the unity of the continent, I believe, is through the education system. We keep learning different things on different parts of the African continent. It is high time that we have that uniform knowledge about the African continent, where it doesn't matter wherever you're coming from, but this is knowledge that is just given to you at a very young age, which promotes the self knowledge which promote you know um history of the african continent knowledge which portrays love for the african and then knowledge that promote that self patriotism for if we all look at one another as brothers and sisters we all look at one another as a people then therefore we will not have any other problem again in coming together as one so education has to be that most effective instrument that we can use in bringing people on board on the same consciousness that promotes unity. And the third point will be the media. Like the last week I made mention, medias are very important everywhere. But today in the African continent, it is the mainstream media that dominates, you know, the information that people receive. And information is very, very key. For if the media portrays a section of the African continent, as an enemy of another section of the African continent, it still makes it very difficult. But how do we make sure that we have that promotion among ourselves through the media outlets that we have within the continent, empower them in making better investigation into things that they report, and then making sure that they drive that African unity in them. Thank you. 
Before I, I come to Reverend Dillon, I will let Stanley also, he wants to say something. Yeah, ab absolutely. And and again, I appreciate the conversation and, and just all of the thoughts that are shared, especially from our young people. I want to just talk about the four C's in terms of how we journey to that place of unity and, and, and the four C's in, in the door of our return agenda is to number one, uh, to correct. Um, there has to be healing uh, amongst Africans. The, the faulty perception that many Africans in the diaspora have, and I'm talking about, when I speak of the diaspora, I'm talking about uh, generations ago, you know, those who have journeyed, not, not um, uh, you know, Africans that recently traveled, but certainly when we go back to, to looking at the evolution of uh, nations like Haiti, other parts of the Caribbean, when we look at Brazil, when we look at the, the, the rest of the Americas, the perception falsely uh, presented to us that somehow um, our forefathers sold us into slavery. Um, uh, that's a part of what needs to be corrected. There, there's, a, there's a huge perception that many African Americans have that they don't want to do deal with Africa, don't want to have anything to do with Africa, because they have this faulty perception that African, their forefathers, sold them into slavery. So we have to correct. There has to be correcting. Number one, we have to fix that faulty perception. And number two, there obviously have to be the journey around healing. So the broad thing is we have to correct that. N number two, we have to better connect as we're talking about doing. Again, um, this sixth uh, region um, holds a part of the key to the economic um, redemption of uh, Africa and African people globally. We're talking about some $6 trillion in, in buying power that Africans outside of the continent have. Uh, that's about the size of the um, gross continental product of the continent of Africa. So that's a lot of economic power that needs to be linked together. And when we connect, we connect for commerce and culture. Those would be the four. So I think that's key that we really begin to understand this path to healing. You know, Haiti's fight to be a part of the African Union should not be a fight. Uh, we have to recognize that almost 100% of uh, those who are from Jamaica are literally Africans. Um, so, so when will Mother Africa come and reclaim our children in the Caribbean and in the Americas? Um, and when will the sons and daughters from afar, like the Bible talks about in Isaiah 60, come back home bringing resources to help rebuild the continent. So I think that's a key part of what needs to happen. So more business leaders outside of the continent that are African in their, in, in their biological evolution need to reconnect with the continent. So we have to open opportunities for investment for Africans abroad to come and invest and make it easier for them to become citizens and, and to gain access and have resources. Um, uh, instead of, I remember I visited an African country a couple of years ago and we were waiting for a meeting with, with the president and the group going in before us was a, 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 was a Chinese group and the group that came in after us was another Chinese group. They're all lining up to speak to and meet with these African leaders. More efforts have to be made to come and find the business leaders and the medical leaders and even the youth leaders that are outside of the continent and give them opportunities to come back home and to deepen their linkages. That's what all the other nations are doing. That, that's what Israel has done. That's what you know. Um, many of the formerly um, communist states are now doing. Georgia, all of these places are relinking. Um, you know, in the Americas. And I think that's an important part of the journey as well.
Thank you very much, uh, Reverend. Stanley, you wanted to say something quickly. We're running out of time. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to say that it's very important that we as the, as the civic agency, as the agency of the people, uh, non-state non actors come together with the African Union and the regional economic communities. We've got the SADC, we've got the East African community, ECOWAS, COMESA, but we, we should come together with them to make sure that we eliminate poverty. As long as there is an African who is hungry, as long as there is a want or a need in any African territory, then this issue of the resource curse is going to be perpetuated. We will keep having conflict, war and civil unrest in our countries and there will be no time for economic development. So it is very important that um, the, the resources that we know we have stop leaking from outside of this, this, this continent and they, they, they produce wealth and they produce gross domestic pro um, uh, products that, that in the end mean each African person or each African territory is well catered for. And, and, and one of the key issues is the removal of the borders like it has been said. I want to challenge the youth of Africa today. We, we appreciate those in the diaspora, but we have to change from a flight response to a fight response. And by fight, I'm not talking about taking up arms and all of this, but they are democratic and constitutional means through which we must hold governments, leadership accountable for these resources that must be equitably distributed in order to eliminate poverty and, 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 and want in, in our countries. Uh, so in, in, in a nutshell, this is what I believe should become the attitude of the Africans and African youth in order to ensure that there is a foundation for the unity that we want to create. Thank you very much, Stanley. And, uh, and I'm going to, I know that we have uh, technical issues. I'm going to ask, I don't know if Reverend Chika is ready to give us a continental and global plan of action, or I should move to Le Wuhan, uh, Chaka to give us a, a summary. I'm not, at the same place, but uh, yeah, I think Reverend is used to, he's a soldier. You may think that he's a priest, but he's also a soldier. So he's used to moving very quickly. <laughs> so he will, he will give us uh, our, our continental and global plan of action. Over to you, Rev. Uh, Thank you very much. The, uh, given the fact that the clock is against us, I'm going to use uh, just five minutes because it's important and uh, for us to keep the time. But let me just say recap for those who joined us today. The Africa Consultative Conference is meant to prepare for the Africa an African diaspora conference. That's what it is, that's what we are doing here. And then secondly, I would like to say that the African African diaspora conference is meant to determine where we are in relation to 1945 Manchester conference and where we should go now. And so I would like to say that the international leadership um, um, team produced the concept note I talked about yesterday. Um, this concept note is our roadmap as we go to uh, October 2021. And so I was going to go through the, this, the, the concept note. We're now going, not going to go through it. And because we are in a modern uh, world with internet communication. The document, it's in our website. I advise that you study it because it's, it's our roadmap. And so we have to make sure everybody is involved. I, as I said yesterday, we have to decolonize our way of thinking. Uh, we have to build bridges between the diaspora and, and those who are on the continent. We have to deal 
with the issue of the international order and equitable, equitable international order. Reparations have been talked about this um, at the, 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 in the last two hours, and I'm not going to talk about it, the economic challenges, uh, pan-Africanism, and spirituality. This is our roadmap. And then uh, on top of the roadmap, we have got an action plan. And the action plan has been agreed upon by the international uh, leadership partners, but it deals with all the other regions. Yesterday, I didn't mention Oceania. So it's North America, South America, Latin America, the Caribbeans, Europe, uh, Asia, and Oceania, because it's important for them to be part of, of it. In terms of Africa, there are all these issues we have to do, but there are key things that we need to focus on. It's this issue, which is if you've got the document uh, shared, um, um, it, it's the issue of the sixth region of Africa, which is the diaspora. We have to work with the AU, that's item number nine, if you can go there, item number nine. We have to work with the AU to make sure that this matter is actualized. We achieve it, besides all the other things that have arisen from uh, this meeting. And then the next one, it's the one that's item number six, will put also this action plan uh, available for you. It's the International Pan-African Network. Uh, what we want to do is that at the end of the conference next year, we will be able to have a movement because you can achieve all these things in one day. We're going to have a movement that's going to make sure we achieve our objectives. The difference between the conference we're going to have and this conference is that this conference is about mobilizing Africans and Africans in the diaspora to work together to deal with all the challenges we are facing. The last thing I would like to say, um, being aware of the limit of time, is the issue about the youth because we listened to them today. I must say I'm excited. I, I have hope about the future. And if 50% of the youth would think like the ones we listened to, we can change the African continent. So there's going to have to be a track on the, on the, of the youth where we work on the issues they've raised until the conference, because all that we are doing is to work on the issues so that by the time we appear, arrive at the conference, we're not going to workshop these issues. We're going to agree on a program of action. And for the youth on the African continent, there's a plan to have the youth coming together. Um, it was planned for last year because of the, this year, for because of the pandemic, it's postponed to next year. So you'll get the dates where the youth, young people on the continent will meet together to deal with the challenges uh, that they've raised here and find solutions to them. I thank you. I, I'm trying to do what I was supposed to do in 30 minutes, I try to do it in um, uh, five minutes. I must say that from the chat room, um, to, uh, there is lots of conversations. There are less questions today than conversations amongst young people who have been listening and engaging, and I'm sure that material will be made available. Thank you very much. Um, advocate, I have done it like a soldier. I have to ask uh, our host, uh, uh, Reverend Khadebe, to just come and say something very quickly. And after that, I'm going to break protocol. If he's ready, he, he can speak, but I can see my sister, Reverend Dr. Angelique uh, Walker-Smith, smiling in the background, and she has to say hello to us. 
We have to hear her voice today. Let's oh, hear your you. voice. Thank you, moderator. It's just an honor to be here. It's been an amazing time together. My co-convener is like so amazing and helping to put all of this together and you as moderator. I, I just wanna say on behalf of the International Committee with my co-convener, thank you, thank you. And hold the date of November the 17th, 10.30 to 12 Eastern Standard, the United States US consultation will take place. And not long after that from Brazil and Latin America. So we'll be sending you the calendar Welcome aboard. We're on a journey to next year. God bless and thanks so much. See you on the Thank 17th. You. Okay. Thank you so much, Reverend. Thank you. Bob uh, Khadeve, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate uh, Gumbi. Uh, for me, it's just to say thank you. Uh, first, thank you to God who's really enabled us to pull this one. Uh, uh, it was really beyond what we have thought and, uh, and we've achieved it, and uh, we really acknowledge God in that respect. But I do want to really thank the conveners. Uh, uh, to, uh, I call him Bra Frank because I grew up as an elder brother, too, so it's not that I don't respect him. Uh, uh, he's Bra Frank. Uh, he's been a visionary in this country for many years, and I also want to thank uh, Reverend Dr. Angelica. These are visionaries. Let's give them a round of applause. Our role is to support them and make sure that they succeed. I'd like to also thank the facilitators, Babum Sima, uh, Simango and Advocate Gumbi today, wonderful. And the way you've really given uh, women an empowerment, I could see that. This is really when women are in charge, things happen. Uh, and all the presenters that have presented, especially the young leaders, I'm energized by the young leaders. Honestly, really, I'm feeling good. And I know that 2063, I might not be there, but the, uh, we will reach the, uh, the, the Africa we want, definitely, with the kind of uh, young leaders. Uh, also, our scribers uh, have really done a great job. We will be coll collating all this information and making sure that it's there on, the, uh, on our website. Our interpreters are unbelievable, moving from English to French. Uh, it really covers the entire uh, continent. I'd also like to acknowledge all our partners. I'd like to particularly also acknowledge the, the technical team of ULP, the, the administrative team. They're doing a great job, and I really want to thank you, uh, team. I'm not going to mention you all by name uh, because you've done a great job beyond my expectation. Um, Tabombegi Foundation, Bramex is not here now, but we really like to ask him to send uh, our thanks to even uh, President uh, uh, Tabombegi for the support he has given us. The Steve Biko Foundation, uh, Steve Biko st stood for black consciousness in a way that really, as young people, uh, revolutionized our thinking and liberated our thinking many, many years ago in this country when we were psychologically in a bondage. And PowerX is a, our marketing team that really has uh, always been our partner. Masiza, we thank you. A mega tech team has provided the website. So it's been a collaborative effort uh, to really do this. And I think if we continue collaborating like this uh, as, as Africans, uh, we will be able to achieve a lot. I'd like to thank our anchor sponsor in particular, uh, Nozala Trust. Uh, I really thank Mamsalu uh, for the support he's given, particularly ULP, all these years as we were running all these kinds of seminars and workshops. Uh, and, and, and empowering particularly women. So, way forward. The roadmap to 2021 conference, Dara is the date now, 22nd uh, to the 29th of October, 2021. The date is set. Uh, it's not going to change. And uh, we want to make sure that we uh, put a stake on the ground and go for it. The venue has been confirmed. We've already booked the hotel here in Johannesburg, uh, in Beachwood, hotel which is right at the airport. Hopefully the vaccine will be there by that time so people will be able to come and travel freely. Uh, speakers are being organized right now. Position papers need to be finalized by the time we arrive there. And I don't want, as I agree with uh, Bra Frank, it's not a talk shop there. We need to have action plan. I was speaking to Stanley, who is the CEO of SADC uh, Lawyers Association. I, I was saying we need to have a, a, another workshop which is gonna be on this platform 
uh, to talk about all the laws and regulations that are militating against us really cooperating, particularly in business. I'm in the energy sector, and I would like to get that and uh, 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 workshop going so that we can be able to do a lot of things. Uh, delegates, uh, please start preparing yourself. Those people, uh, please present us. Identify the right people in different regions uh, that are going to be participating there. Uh, I'm really also thankful to DECO. Uh, they've really been supportive to us in uh, getting speakers, for instance, getting us uh, Reverend Dillion uh, of the door, uh, who has really charged us. I really like the specific things that we need to do. United Nations is supporting us. AU is supporting us. And we want to finalize all their participation. I also want to say that uh, it coincided this event with the 20th celebration of the World Conference uh, on Racism that happened here in 2001, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm correct. Uh, so we've been talking with government about how to synergize and really create a great movement. So I really like to encourage everyone, those that are listening online right now, stay close to this process. I've been seeing quite a number of you asking, how do I get into this platform? Just send us an email, uh, and, and Nono uh, is the person who's going to be in contact with you. We want to mobilize all people that have, can help and support and become partners, and some of them have already offered to me that they want to be part and, and give their resource to this. You're welcome to do so. Uh, on behalf of all of us, particularly uh, the conveners, I would like to thank everyone who's participated. If I didn't mention you by name, it doesn't mean you're not important, but all of us work together. Thank you very much. Uh, I was working with a program that I was given. So, you've given us the preparations. Now we have to close with some meat. And I'm going to ask Lewukhan Chaka to give us a sense of the meat of what was today. You've given us the, the preparations and the technical. Lewukhan, over to you. Thank you, Advocate. Um, what an amazing conference. Let me start with those few words. It was a wonderful um, mix between yesterday, listening to the, our elders on the continent, um, the diasporan, it was, the theme was really around the diasporan um, and really how they feel. But today there was a different energy. There was this youth energy, this burst of energy that came through on the stage that was so amazing. And you know, it's always nice when we have these kind of conferences and we convene to talk about the African continent that we bring our young minds together to be able to speak their truth, to speak what's going on on the ground. Today, ladies and gentlemen, um, we had a wonderful, wonderful opening, very vibrant by Reverend Dylan, where he was really um, talking to us about the economic agenda um, for world leaders and how do we take this and we look at it from a cultural perspective. And this, um, those four words, repatriation, restoration, healing, um, a revival, how do we go towards a healing um, as a whole? And you know, one of the things that stood out when he talked about, um, when he was addressing was when he said brand Africa, where is brand Africa? And it, it, lies, in, and, and he, it lies in your hands and my hands. And really this, you know, a consciousness to say that um, how do we then um, make use of uh, our diasporan community to, to, to better the continent? You know, then we then move to our youth um, and we hear really lovely perspectives from uh, such different uh, uh, elements um, from anything from being talked to about um, the infrastructure on the ground, you know, the hospitals. How is it that um, we are building infrastructure to make sure that Africans actually stay within the continent? Um, that this narrative of um, flying overseas for medical re reasons become a thing of the altar that the youth can then stay in our ground by Dr. Emmy. Then we then look to South Sudan and Ms. Ria, um, I mean, Advocate Majanku, you, you talked to her to say, you know, born and grown up in war, but, you know, how do we stop it so that we don't find that, you know, um, Dr. Dylan talks about a healing, but how is it that um, we can talk about the healing from the past, about this colonization and what happened, but how do we stop our young people from also requiring healing from war that is caused when their countries are supposed to be liberated? So really 
you know, from South Sudan, really on the ground and reminding us that as much as we want to heal from the past, there's still healing that we need to do in today, in today's world, which um, ties in very nicely with the theme yesterday from the Manchester conference that talked about the spiritual part of the continent, that healing takes place in that um, center with the church movement that even Dr. Dylan talked about. We then move to Dr. Uh, I mean, we move to Osman, where he talks to us about a history and reminds us that, you know what, we need to um, retrace our steps. We need to look at what our forefathers had done. We need to go back and teach our young people about this wonderful Africa that we have and this lineage of, you know, um, that, that, that is within us, this lineage of pride that we can do things by ourselves and you know, recounting that and actually putting it into curriculum. So we send out patriotic African children for tomorrow. So that was a really lovely um, reminder from Osman. And then we moved over to, um, uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name properly, excuse me, but I think it was Ngimo uh, from Cameroon who talked about you know, the, the, the circle of life, you know, that we have all these Africans that get educated, but then what is it that you're bringing back? How are you building the continent after you get educated? And what has been done in the past then, you know, prejudices the other young Africans from getting the opportunity. And obviously she then, you know, talks about this um, silent crisis, you know, one would call it a silent crisis because it's been going on for so long in Cameroon, but there's, um, why is it not coming to an end? Why is it that our leaders are aware of it? Um, and yet today we have this young lady who's sitting there and saying for six years, these are some of the things that she's been advocating. And before then there was all these injustices. So really to say, why is it that some crises on the continent are prioritized over others and, and challenging us in this platform to say, how do we get involved um, to assist so that you know, the girl child can be involved and the girl child can have the opportunity to access these opportunities. Then Stanley um, so nicely laid out this value chain, this value chain to say the youth needs to get involved, whether it's in politics, we're done with the liberation um, um, part, uh, parties, we're glad you got us liberated, where's the youth voice, how are we going to take it there? He also talks about it in a commercial sense, in a sense of you know, tying up with uh, what Osman was saying to say, we need to have that pride. We need to, as youth, um, to be involved in every single part of the chain. And uh, then we have um, uh, our professor, I mean, uh, Reverend Chikana, who then, you know, says to us the uh, practical, the practical nature of this. And I think for me, those are the closing words that as much as we've sat here and we've talked, um, you know, we need to then look at um, initiatives, like you said, the International Pan-African Network. How is it that we get involved? Reverend um, Angelique talked about the US-Africa consultations. As much as we talk, let us, our, 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 our parting word must be action. Let us, um, when we meet on the 22nd, 29th of October, as much as we'll be solutioning there, let, let us come with evidence that between now and then, this is the action, this is what has been done. So let us start off that conference by saying this is what's been achieved. And then as we go into that uh, conference, how do we then continue with those words? Um, thank you to everyone. Thank you to the conveners. Thank you to the speakers and wish you well. Ula. Thank you. Thank you, Lewuhan. Adimi, Ria, Usma, Ngimu, Stanley. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. I want to leave you with the words of Franz Fanon who said that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or you know. And I think you are going to fulfill it and not disappoint us. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Organizers, thank you very much. Sorry we went over time a little bit, 12 minutes. If I 